Okay, uh, greetings, colleagues and friends. Uh, my name is Washington Ocheng. I'm the um, current head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Imperial College London. I am delighted to welcome you all in person and virtually to Imperial College London and our department. So I've just been thinking, what can I say about uh, Professor Walter Beitheit? So let me start by saying that he grew up in the Flemish part of Belgium. He studied bioscience, engineering at the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. He had the opportunity to travel to Ecuador for four months as part of his final year research project, studying the impact of land use on the hydrological processes of high mountain, wetland, and grassland ecosystems. Walter graduated with maximum cum laude he was first of a class, or in a class, of 180 students. Walter then stayed in Louvain to embark upon a Doctor of Philosophy on the same topic as his research project, supervised by Professor Sepe Dekas and Guido Waisur. He did extensive fieldwork in Ecuador uh, during that period. He obtained his PhD in 2004 and continued one year as a postdoctoral researcher in the same group. He kept going. He obtained a European Marie Curie Fellowship to work with the research group of Professor Keith Biven at Lancaster University, finishing that in 2007. He then moved to the University of Bristol in October 2007 to take up an RCUK fellowship in risk and uncertainty, but then decided to move to Imperial College in 2009 to work with Professor Howard Wheater. Walter became a lecturer in 2011, senior lecturer in 2014, reader in 2017, and finally professor of hydrology and water resources in 2020. So over the last decade, he has built a successful and dynamic research group through which more than 20 PhD students, 11 postdoctoral researchers, and numerous MSc and MH students have passed. He currently manages a large portfolio of research projects focused on water resources and environmental change. He is a clear ambassador of the colleges renowned reputation as a global university with projects and collaborations all over the world, from Peru through the United Kingdom to the Philippines. Walter was recently awarded the prestigious Darcy Medal of the European Geosciences Union for outstanding scientific contributions in water resources research and water resources engineering and management. So it is at this point Having read all of that, I invite Professor Walter Batait, please step up and deliver your inaugural lecture. Thank you, Washington. Good morning, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Good evening, perhaps good night, depending on where you dial in from. Indeed, it's my honor to give this lecture to a great audience here in person, but also hopefully a large audience online. That's perhaps one of the, the main advantages of the pandemic that we really managed to organize global events and uh, allow people to come in uh, from all over the world. So really thank you very much, Washington. It's uh, a great pleasure to give today my uh, inaugural lecture, taking you on a virtual journey throughout the world in pursuit of this concept of global water security. But before I do so, I would like to do a little experiment for which I'll need an, uh, an assistant. Would someone be willing to come and help me with um, a quick experiment? <laughs> Thank you very much. Give me a round of applause. It's quite straightforward. All I need you to do is read out the number that uh, is there on the scale that gives us the, 
the mass of this, this banana plant uh, together with the, the soil and uh, the pot it's standing in. So if you can please do that, I'll note it down on the, the whiteboard. And that's grand. Thank you very much. A round of applause. Good. Back to the lecture. I promise to take you on a journey through the world. I will start in uh, the Andes. As much, most of you, or many of you, will know, uh, or as uh, Washington indeed just mentioned, uh, the place where my own scientific career started uh, as an MSc student in Ecuador. But here I take you to Peru, very close, a view over the, the Andes, the largest mountain range in the world, uh, from the very southern tip of the South American continent, all along the uh, Pacific Ocean, uh, over to Central America, and even further north uh, into the US and, and Canada. A very diverse and complex system, both from a human perspective, lots of different ancient and modern cultures and societies, but also very complex from a, a natural environment. Uh, very diverse climate patterns, uh, some of the, the wettest and the driest places on Earth, a complex um, vegetation, soils, geology, and sometimes also quite a, a harsh place, especially up in the, the mountains, uh, cold climates, uh, cold nights, uh, long dry seasons. So quite a challenge for people to make a living in that kind of, of environment. Indeed, especially in the, the Altiplano, as you can see here, vast highlands, as they're called, consisting of grasslands, wetlands, um, and uh, uh, forests and other ecosystems uh, intercepted by those deep and steep valleys where people try and cultivate steep slopes prone to erosion, uh, prone to, to runoff. So a difficult environment where people really rely a lot on the, the ecosystem services uh, that the, the surrounding environment uh, provides, including one of which uh, is, of course, water, fundamental to all life and particularly pronounced in those, uh, those regions. So people use water for things like agriculture, uh, for human consumption, for industries. Uh, so people are also exposed to episodes when there's not enough water, uh, indeed long dry seasons which might evolve into, into drought periods. Uh, but also potentially people might be exposed to too much water. Uh, heavy tropical thunderstorms and rainfall events might uh, create episodes of flooding, as you can see here, for instance, uh, the Vilcanota River close to the, uh, the famous archaeological site of, um, uh, of Machu Picchu. So a good example, a good illustration of this concept of water security, which is a cornerstone of sustainable development, the fact that, that we try and capture the fact that uh, people rely, we all rely on water of sufficient quantity and quality to, uh, to, make, uh, to, to live the life we, uh, we value but that we're also exposed to risks related to, to water. And that's really what we try to, uh, to contribute to as, an, uh, as a research group. I'm a, hydrology, I'm a hydrologist and water resources engineer, as my title uh, mentions, and we try to contribute to that much broader concept of water security. Indeed, you can call that uh, and one of the, the wicked problems that, that society is, uh, is trying to solve, in the sense that water security is very multidimensional, depends on natural processes, but also human processes, a lot of different activities that interact, uh, that feedback, and that all together determine whether a person living in a certain location is water secure or what's the level of, of water security. And what do scientists do when they come across a very complex, wicked problem, or try and develop a, a framework to make sense and try and, and, and uh, pick it apart into smaller, more easily digestible problems. And that's what I'm going to do, uh, give you a bit of the, the theoretical framework, it's a scientific lecture after all, to guide you and to show where the position of a hydrologist and water resources engineer is within that much broader context of water security. And we we'll use these different ways of, of entry uh, or looking at the concept of water security, but one way of doing it is by looking at water as a, as a risk, uh, too little, avoid, try and avoid that we have too little or too, um, uh, too much. And risk is a, is a concept that often dealt with in, um, uh, in, in natural, uh, natural science, particularly in relation to natural hazards, including the IPCC, for instance. You might remember last week uh, the publication of the, the latest sixth uh, IPCC assessment report, unfortunately a bit snowed under by the other awful news that's happening in the world at the moment. But so the IPCC, for instance, looks at risk, in that case climate risk, 
and defines it as a combination of the, the natural hazards, the physical process that happens, for instance, a flood, but also the exposure of people to that flood, as well as their capacity to, to deal with their, their resilience towards uh, that, um, that flood. And so, for instance, in the context of water, take, for instance, water shortage, then that water shortage really is the combination of those three processes. And as hydrologists, we particularly look at uh, water shortage as being essentially a function of both water supply, how much water is available, but also water demand, how much water is needed. There are places in the world that don't have much water, deserts for instance, but that don't really have a problem with that given that there's not many people needing or relying upon that water. So the water shortage, the physical component of that risk can be uh, segregated out into a combination of demand and, and supply. And again, as a hydrologist, we're particularly interested in understanding that supply. And if we pick that again apart, then we, we will typically see that in a landscape, uh, such as the, the uh, river basin you can see here, that uh, very different hydrological processes work together to determine the total amount of water available, for instance, in the river in a certain part of the, the landscape. Using here an example of, for instance, a mountainous catchment, if you go to the very top, then a lot of water comes from what we call the cryosphere, snow, ice, glaciers. But the further down you go, other processes take over and become more prominent. Wetlands, for instance, subsurface storage in hill slopes and the hilly parts up to potentially very large subsurface aquifers uh, of the type that, for instance, my colleague Agent Butler is looking at in more detail. So that is the little role that hydrologists play to try and understand those processes and how they cascade through to inform or to, to determine the broader uh, context of water security. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we need to understand the, the, the hydrology. If we are to make uh, informed uh, decisions, if, if we, we try to get to grips with that water availability, then ideally, really, we should try to get to grips with all the different processes, the flows and stores of water through that, that landscape. From very fast surface flows on the steep hill slopes, water that after it rains get into the, the river very quickly, create peak flows, uh, to the very slow stores of subsurface storage and migration that can take many, many days or even many months to get into the river. And obviously they will contribute in different moments and different locations to that dynamic process of river flow, as you know, is very variable in space and time. And those processes are governed by the different ecosystems and the different processes as they happen in the vegetation, so the weather patterns obviously uh, as well, vegetation, soils, and you can imagine that for instance a, a grassland ecosystem as here on top will react uh, in very, and, and behave hydrologically in very different ways uh, than for instance a, a lush mountain cloud forest as you can see here at the, the bottom. And the main problem with doing that, with getting to grips with those processes, is that for the, the large part of the world, we count on very few data, quantitative information about those, those processes. Indeed, most of the world is hydrologically what we would call data scarce. There's very, very few, very little uh, quantitative observations data on those different, different processes. The lack of, lack of data, and that breaks, takes me back to the very start of my uh, research career, where uh, one of the, the main, the first challenges I had to, to overcome when studying the, uh, the grassland, the mountain grassland ecosystem, as you can see there, which is one of the, the main natural water towers for much of the, the tropical Andes, uh, but where I was faced with a lack, of, a lack of data, a lack of quantitative information to start doing analyses. So I had to figure out how to build a V-notch weir, which is a type of structure that hydrologists use to measure river flow, to start collecting those, those data. And this is probably not the most professional uh, V-notch wear uh, that you'll ever seen in your, uh, your career, but it did the job and allowed me to implement some experiments. And the type of experiments that we implemented was work, by the way, that I did when um, working with the, the, the PROMAS research team at the University of Cuenca in Ecuador, was try and compare some, some different catchments to assess the impact of human activities, particularly land use, such as cultivation and pine forestation, on the hydrological response. 
And so we made, we, we collected those data, analyzed them, and actually found that, for instance, pine plantations consume a lot of water, evaporate it, transpire it, and as a result, it's not available anymore uh, to run off in the, the stream. So that's quite a, quite a big impact on stream flow, as the hydrologists will be able to, to gauge here on the, the flow duration curve, which is the typical way we um, summarize the impact of um, uh, plant use on uh, both peak flows here on the left-hand side and base flows, which are important for water supply. So we did that experiment and actually con uh, gathered quite some useful information. But a, a single catchment or a single experiment obviously doesn't say too much. One, uh, sp uh, one swallow doesn't make summer, as they say. With a single experiment, you can't extrapolate, you can't say much at, a, at the regional scale, especially not for an environment as, as diverse and complex as the, the Andes. The best way to solve that is by doing more experiments, but it took me pretty much an entire PhD to set up one or two of those um, comparisons. So you can imagine how much effort it is to repeat that over an area the size of the, the Andes. But I was lucky enough then to team up with an, uh, a team led by the um, uh, fellow hydrologist, Berthe Bievre, who was at the um, NGO Condesan at that moment, leading an, a research and development project called Proyecto Paramo Andino, where they had good interactions and, and uh, good contacts with uh, NGOs and universities and communities with similar interests. And they were able to set up what you could call a community of practice, a group of, of people with the same interest, understanding the hydrology of Andean ecosystems and the impact of land use change uh, thereon. And obviously, sharing the work makes it much easier. So we, we started setting up different uh, experiments all over the, the Andes. And that started more than 10 years ago, and now the, the network has grown with more, well more than 100 um, uh, members uh, managing, I think, around 59 sites or 59 catchments in 22 sites all over the Andes from Venezuela in the north down to, uh, to Chile and, and in between. And that was a, a great joint effort to extend that evidence base on uh, the, um, the hydrological processes as well as the, the impact of different types of, of land management, cultivation, livestock, forestation. Uh, and that obviously allowed us to draw much more firm and robust conclusions about how those ecosystems behave and how, how management can, can alter them. And I won't go into too much detail for the hydrologists or anyone who's interested. You can read up the um, excellent paper by uh, Boris Ochoa uh, Tokachi, uh, who analyzed this data set as part of his PhD in our, in our group. So that's great, but obviously as scientists, we're always interested in seeing how we can improve that, that process and do even better. And so there are a couple of, of entry points or a couple of ways we try to, to improve and, and go beyond uh, and, and, and extend that, that activity. And one of the bottlenecks we came across was the, the lack of or the fact that, that the instruments we used were still quite expensive, uh, quite prone to damage, uh, quite difficult to operate. Uh, in those quite remote and harsh environments where we, where we implemented them. Here you see, for instance, Junior, one of the EMEA technicians doing a great job with um, dealing with, with one of the, the rain gauges. And as a research group, and particularly as engineers, that was definitely a challenge we were, we were keen to take up. And so we, uh, we tried and, and explored, uh, especially riding on the wave of what is called open hardware, uh, Arduino, uh, Raspberry Pi, and similar technologies, and see whether we could use that, that technology to build sensors that are uh, cheaper, more robust, and more user-friendly to use in those environments. And we managed to do so with good success. Those, those new sensors we built, as you can see here, for instance, um, uh, are used within EMEA, for instance, the Bolivian site most, most recently, but also allowed us to explore their use in different contexts. For instance, in that other great mountain range in the world, the Himalayas, which deals with very similar problems of water scarcity and flooding, and also deals with the lack of data. So we used and developed, for instance, new technologies, in this case based on laser sensors, to measure river flow in the, the great Himalayan rivers and integrate them, explore the use of that technology in the context of um, flood resilience building and community-based early warning uh, flood early warning in India and Nepal, together with collaborators of, for instance, Practical Action, uh, local universities like IIT, Ruki, uh, Tribhuvan University in Nepal, as well as more local ones, university local ones here, like the University of, uh, of Birmingham. And people like uh, Johnny Paul and Neeraj Sa in the group has done, have done great um, 
may have made great contributions to developing and testing those, uh, those sensors. Or more recently, the, the work of um, Will Vaness in our research group, PhD student who looks at exploring those technologies in the context of um, drought early warning in the Horn of Africa, another region that is extremely exposed to, to drought risk uh, and also counts with very few uh, data. So great opportunities there to think about how to leverage new technologies to, um, to, to generate more data, kind of the bread and butter of quanti the kind of quantitative analysis uh, that, that helps uh, supporting uh, drought and, and, and flood resilience. But data can only look back. We can only measure what we see at the moment, look back to uh, uh, historic data, but data don't help us with looking into the, the future. By very definition, we can't measure the future. We, also, we only can make predictions and try and use the past to make predictions about the future. And obviously, that's what a, a catchment manager wants to do, not just to know what happened after you deforested the catchment, but actually thinking about whether it's, um, it's relevant or what kind of activities can be implemented uh, to increase water availability or protect against peak flows in the, in the future. The kind of what if questions, uh, as they're known in, in policy, what if we allow farmers to cultivate a landscape and obviously make a local living, uh, that's obviously great for local development, but might potentially have negative side effects downstream. So a policymaker really tries to balance out those different, um, different interests and, and decide what's best in the, in the grand scheme of things. And so questions like, what if agriculture expands within mountains? What if uh, plant, pine, plant, uh, pine trees are being built? Will, will they uh, consume too much water and create uh, drought or uh, increased drought risk downstairs, uh, downstream better? Uh, what with increasing urbanization, what does that mean in terms of water supply, but also demand, or the big elephant in the room, how will climate change, for instance, change water availability, peak flows and base flows in the, the future? We can't measure those things directly, so instead we use models, basically computational representations of our system, to make those, those predictions and to run scenarios about potential future change. And so another big activity within the research group is um, designing, building those models, testing them, and making them uh, up for uh, scenario analysis. And here's, for instance, an example of a, a model representing those wetlands that I mentioned earlier and trying to represent all the different types of, of processes, evaporation and transpiration, water consumption of the vegetation, infiltration of water into the soils, storage and, and uh, water flow in the subsurface, bring them all together in our computational model that allows us to run scenarios and make predictions about the future. Here, for instance, a model that uh, Anthony within our team is, uh, is working on. But also going beyond just the hydrology, I started off with showing you how hydrology is, is a piece of a puzzle, of a much bigger puzzle uh, towards water security. So we've also tried to bring in some of those other components. Here, for instance, a, a model that uh, Jimmy O'Keefe, another PhD student, has built to incorporate also the human component. In this particular case, how farmers in India make decisions about the type of uh, and the source of water to use for irrigation, uh, because they can often choose between using groundwater, which might deplete subsurface aquifers, versus surface water, which is often less, less reliable. So to get to grips with the way that people uh, use uh, water and therefore alter the, 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 the flows of water through the landscape, you need to add uh, that, that human component as, uh, as well. Or the work of uh, Clara Jimeno in our group, looking at the catchment as a, as a whole system, uh, using the, the expertise of my esteemed colleague uh, Anna Meech on systems analysis, trying to, to look at the different ways that people make use of the water cycle, directly water for consumption, but also indirectly through the other ecosystem services, uh, such as agriculture, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem preservation, which all contribute somehow to the quality of life that people experience in different parts of the catchment. So here, uh, and a systems model that tries to get to grips without that complexity and the upstream, downstream linkages in the, the catchment that provides water to the city of Lima in, in Peru. So models, a very important aspect of, of making predictions and evaluate scenarios uh, that uh, uh, can help with making better decisions on, uh, on catchment management. So data and models are very useful, are very good tools but obviously someone needs to use them. So the third ingredient in, in sustainable catchment management is the, the people. And over the last few years, we've had the opportunity of exploring a bit more 
how, how people enter that, that picture and how they interact with which hydrological knowledge and how hydrological knowledge is being created to support decision making on, on water. And we're a good company because that's also an aspect that's very high on policy makers agenda. They look for instance at the UN Sustainable Development Goals which has this, this goal 17 which is all about partnerships, interaction um, and collaboration between science but also governments, industry, the third sector, local communities, really as a way to, to enhance uh, the, um, the, the participation and the, the way that knowledge is being created to support sustainable development. And there are many reasons why participation is good, but just to give you a few examples, uh, so for instance, as you, if you want to make sure that the, the information and the knowledge that you create is, is relevant for a problem at hand, obviously you need to involve the end users in the problem identification. What are the bottlenecks? What is really the type of knowledge that, 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 can, that can support making local decisions about, for instance, water availability, uh, ecosystem management? But also knowledge integration. Obviously scientists produce knowledge, that's their, their job, but they don't have an, um, a monopoly on creating knowledge. And indeed, especially in the, the context of water, Local people often already know an awful lot about how water moves through the landscape, where water is, what are the dynamics. And so using that, that local knowledge and integrating that in the more formal scientific knowledge is, is increasingly important and recognize that we really need to be able to do that uh, to, to maximize, again, the knowledge base for decision making. And even in the data collection, you might be familiar with the concept of citizen science also very, very high on, on, on the policymakers' minds as a way to include uh, people not just in, in using the knowledge but really also in the, the nitty-gritty of the scientific discovery process, collecting data with uh, low cost and, and easy to use sensors, interpreting data. So involving people throughout the whole chain can make uh, of, of data uh, and, uh, and knowledge creation is, is increasingly uh, important. And so over the last few years we've had the opportunity to team up with some great social scientists like Art, um, Julian, Timos, and others to look a bit more broadly at, the, at, at, at a, a catchment and how knowledge is being created and, and how we can involve and, and make each, each aspect of what we call the, the knowledge creation process uh, as, as, in, as um, uh, participatory and, and inclusive as, 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 uh, as possible. Using uh, uh, low-cost sensors, for instance, to um, to allow people to make, to, to take, um, uh, collect data in the context of um, uh, participatory flood forecasting, but also uh, using um, ICT tools for people to access the data and, uh, and explore uh, and, and extract knowledge themselves. And the way we've done that was very much through this concept of environmental virtual observatories, which was pitched by the UK Natural Environment Council about 10 years ago as a way to explore how new technologies can play a role in making each of those, those, those steps in the knowledge creation process more participatory. Again, from uh, the, the sensors themselves, and as much as we use the sensors we build uh, to collect data, we also try and use them as a way to, to incorporate and, and make, uh, uh, incorporate local people and make that, that, um, that process more participatory to the use of ICT tools uh, like, um, uh, like tablets to give people better access to information and also to, to comment and interact and, and give their, uh, their own uh, opinion about uh, what, what they see and how they, uh, they um, uh, ex experience their, uh, their environment. So we've been able to really do some great work thanks to the, to the help of a lot of people, including Zed, who's somewhere in the, in the room, uh, has uh, done some great work on, on embarking upon that, that interdisciplinary challenge of um, uh, exploring and integrating different knowledge bases within the context of water resources management in places like um, uh, Peru, Nepal, Kyrgyzstan, and, uh, and others. And really the end goal of doing that is, is to come towards something that, that UNESCO calls open science, basically make the science as, as accessible, uh, as, as open, and as useful as, as possible for the whole of, of humankind. And here, we should, should shout out to UNESCO and especially the International Intergovernmental Hydrology Program with which we've been working for I think more than a decade now and had the opportunity to contribute to, uh, to policy briefs and, and publications that again uh, enable or facilitate knowledge transfer and uptake of knowledge in, an, uh, in a policy context. Well, not just publications, 
Also, for instance, in the group, we try to put a lot of effort in uh, documenting, for instance, the use of the sensors, making all the, the blueprints and the code available, uh, creating uh, videos, doing online training and interactive workshops to, again, uh, involve people and, and providing their, the opportunity to participate in the process of data collection, analysis, and, uh, and interpretation. So now to go back to the Andes, how are all these concepts and tools and grand ideas actually being used? Well, to go back to the, the Andes, I mentioned that it's a, a system under severe pressure uh, where uh, water security uh, is really very high on the minds of local policymakers. And obviously, they've been doing that for a long time, building infrastructure like dams, reservoirs, canals, uh, to store the water and to ensure uh, that uh, small communities all the way to big, um, big cities do have uh, better access to, to water. And that has worked really well and has enhanced living standards over the last decades tremendously. But those solutions also have a couple of problems. They tend to be quite large and expensive. Building a dam is something you need, you need sufficient resources for. But they're also not very flexible in the sense that if, for instance, rainfall amounts change under the context of climate change, then your dam might actually not be able to, to fill up anymore or might, might be too small or maybe too large. And so you can't really adapt to changing environments, changing boundary conditions. And so for that reason, policymakers have been exploring new types of managing water, new tools in the toolbox of the, the water resources manager, if you will, to see whether we, uh, they can make that whole process of water management uh, more flexible, more adaptive, cheaper, and more uh, future-proof when, when boundary conditions change. Some examples, for instance, are uh, protecting the upland areas to make sure that the water they provide is of good quality, uh, soil conservation to enhance the, uh, the infiltration of water in, in aquifers where it can be stored and, and extracted much more easily than when it runs off very quickly in the river, uh, to even local surface storage as well as artificial uh, recharge, forcing water to infiltrate and, and, and um, replenish the, uh, the groundwater re reservoirs. So these are novel or newer types of managing the landscape which are often put under the um, the header of, of nature-based solutions, because a common characteristic is that they, they apply or they, they leverage uh, natural processes much more than the, the classic uh, concrete-based uh, storage mechanisms and, and, um, and, and solutions. But the main problem of doing that is that many of those processes are not as well known as, as the, the classic solutions. If you reforest and, um, a catchment, then you can expect that you have more recharge, more infiltration, but it's very hard to quantify. And so the main bottleneck is really having that quantitative evidence uh, to, um, uh, to, to build it into an engineering solution. And so one example of the type of solutions that policymakers were looking at is part of what is called sowing and harvesting, a local practice that has been going on for, for centuries, uh, almost a kind of ancient practice, where people built local small uh, canals that diverted water from a, a little mountain stream, as you can see here, and dumped it onto the hill slope where it's allowed to infiltrate, migrate, and um, uh, support and replenish uh, reservoirs further downstream. And so an, uh, a solution that drew a lot of interest, but where a lack of scientific information really was uh, or, or prevented the, the further exploration in the context of, of water engineering. And the, the team of Condesan, which I mentioned earlier, uh, had, um, uh, for that reason, did an, an experiment with uh, a fluorescent tracer, as you can see here, to quantify the, uh, the, 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 the duration and the residence time as, uh, in, um, uh, of the water in that hill slope and actually see when exactly it resurfaces and, and, how it's, um, and to which extent it can replenish base flows during the, the dry season. And so then we took those, those results from that experiment and built a model, this work that's led by uh, Boris uh, as part of his, his PhD, and we built a model to actually evaluate whether such a system, if expanded and upscaled to the whole catchment, could effectively contribute to uh, base flow, river flow during the dry season, which is when it's most critical for water supply for, for instance, the, the city of Lima that sits at the foot of the, um, uh, the Andean mountains. And we found that effectively those nature-based solutions that, that artificial recharge can help increasing base flow, but as you can see, not through the whole uh, dry period. So it definitely cannot replace the artificial storage which is already in place, which you can see here with the, um, 
uh, the, the, the red um, uh, line of, um, uh, of, of river flow, uh, but it can enhance and actually make that, that uh, classic infrastructure more effective uh, and um, uh, allowing it to do more, for instance, under future, uh, future conditions of, of change. So a good example of how a combination of classic and new approaches is probably the most flexible way to enhance uh, the, the system towards the future while still keeping some options open uh, without needing, for instance, to build a, a major new reservoir uh, in, the, uh, in the future. And that's really the whole, the whole purpose of, um, uh, of, of the approach, is to try and find, depending on the, the local setting, depending on the, the different options, the different tools in the toolbox, from classic infrastructure like reservoirs and flood defenses, and also some of those, those new approaches, and try and think, gather the evidence, the scientific evidence, that allows uh, to build and to come up with the, the best combination of approaches within a certain environmental and uh, social context. And that's, for instance, what's happening in the, the river basin of the city of Quito, where the government of Peru is experimenting with uh, new ways, what they call sharing the benefits of ecosystem services, uh, building, uh, setting up a water fund uh, in which uh, the, the water consumers of, of, uh, of Lima uh, pay into and which is then used to restore and to invest in watershed interventions that benefit both the upstream and downstream populations. And that's work that's led by uh, SUNAS, uh, the uh, Water Regulation Agency, a team of people with which we've been working also for a very, very long time, and where that interaction between science and policy has really allowed us to, to focus and to, to generate new science that directly feeds into uh, better local water resources management. Good, and that's all I wanted to say, but before we finish, uh, we need to continue our experiment. So if my uh, little helper would be willing to come back and read out the, um, the scale again, then we can uh, finish off our experiment. So if you can tell me. Thank you very much. Give him a round of applause, please. So our plant here has actually lost weight. Maybe it's on a diet, or maybe someone stole a banana, or maybe the plant has been growing, but instead it's been consuming water, and the reduction in, um, uh, in weight might well be the amount of water that has been evaporated or transpired through the plant uh, and escaped into the, the air. And indeed, six grams of water has escaped. And this is an experiment that is as simple as it might be quite common in hydrology and called a lysimeter experiment as a way to, uh, to quantify the, uh, the, con the water consumption of different types of plants. And that is very useful information. For instance, you can use that uh, to calculate the, uh, the crop coefficient of the pema Montit equation, which you can then use to uh, calculate the crop water requirements of, say, for instance, a banana plant a plantation at the coast of Ecuador, at least if you make a couple of uh, corrections and errors, because obviously the type of uh, environment you've got here is quite different. So you might want to calculate the difference in temperature, the difference in radiation, not just the amount of radiation, but also the, uh, the frequency, because fluorescent light here is, uh, is obviously a very different wavelength than natural light. You need to correct for the um, uh, the incident angle of the solar radiation as well as the daylight uh, time. And if you do all that, uh, then you should get a result. And I expect that result in my mailbox tomorrow by 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> if not, a late uh, penalty will apply. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Professor uh, the tradition normally is that we don't allow questions at inaugural lectures. That's the tradition. But given how close to home the topic has been, and given how excellent the presentation has been, uh, Professor Wouter has, um, we decided to make an exception. Okay, so um, he's willing to take a few questions. Um, and just using the prerogative of the, the chair, um, I've, I've got one question just to kick it off. I mean, you mentioned this participatory data collection. Um, and I was wondering how you validate that. You know, when, when people send data to you, they capture data, how do you validate that information? That's a good question, and indeed one that's, that is quite common, especially in the context of citizen science, and one of the main 
uh, criticism, uh, but they're not, they're not experts. Uh, how um, uh, can you be sure that the data is of, of good quality? There are statistical ways to, um, uh, to, to test that. And, and for instance, in our case, we have compared the, uh, the data that come from the, the low-cost sensors as well as data and, and, and instruments managed by, um, uh, by, by citizens with the, the classic scientific approaches and, and, and instruments and actually found that very often the, the data is of, of very similar, similar quality. Not always, but even there, there are ways to deal with that. You, you don't always need extremely high quality data and, obviously, and, and often there is actually more value or at least as much value in having more lower quality data than fewer high quality data. And obviously, that depends a lot on, on the specific type of question that, that, you, um, uh, that you ask. But um, in, in many of the, the studies and, and the research that we do, having actually more data and covering a larger area, which, for instance, allows you to, to look at spatial patterns of precipitation, water availability in soils, etc., it gives more scientific value than having fewer and higher quality data. But it's obviously very, very context dependent, but we do have pretty robust ways to, to estimate uh, the, the, the quality of, of citizen science or, or novel, uh, novel approaches to data collection uh, to, um, to account for those issues. Is this the same as crowdsourcing or is it different? Uh, crowdsourcing is a type of citizen science that focuses particularly on the, the data collection aspect. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, analogy. Thank you. Um, any question, please, from the audience? Yes, Stephen. Professor Stephen Smith. Yeah, as Wouter's head of section, I'm delighted to answer the next, uh, to pose the next question. Yes. Wouter, you mentioned lots of different. Did you Sorry. Did you want to apply to both the other people online? So, Professor Stephen Smith is our head of the Environment and Water Resources section in the department. Stephen. Thank you, Wouter. Yeah, great talk. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. You mentioned lots of different um, mountain regions around the world. Um, do you find that the problems are similar in all of these regions, generally speaking? That's the part A. Part B, um, do you find if you've, you've validated, developed a model in one region, you can actually use it to predict behaviour in another? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, a famous hydrologist once said, uh, every catchment is unique, uh, and that is definitely the case in, in mountain environments. Uh, so it's, it's mostly a matter of making sure that you cover the, the, the range of processes as you can, you can expect them. And that, in a way, is, almost, is also an advantage of, of mountain environments. You have so much variability that you can actually, by, by choosing your, your catchments and locations right, you can, you can capture a lot of that, that variability. Um, and so you, you do have similar processes um, in, in different mountain environments, especially in relation to... Uh, to the, the, the natural processes, the way that water runs off, uh, the way that, um, that snow melts, the ways that, that, that hill slopes uh, behave. Uh, but where mountain, reg mountain regions obviously differ very significantly is in the, the human component, especially the, 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 the social and cultural way that, um, uh, that, 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 that people make use of the, the landscape. Uh, I've got here a, a photo of, of Nepal, just to contrast uh, Nepal with, um, with, for instance, Peru. The way the type of agriculture that is done in, in Nepal, because people eat far less meat, is much more focused on uh, growing cereals, for instance, as you can see here from, from the photo. While in a, in, in, a, in a mountain range like, like the Andes, you'll have much more livestock grazing. And so that obviously has implications both for the, the impact that people have on the environment, uh, cultivation uh, uses and, 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 and alters the hydrological processes in, in quite a different way than, than livestock does. And it all, but it also has an impact on the way that people use uh, the water and, and, and uh, the portfolio of ecosystem services, if you will, that they, uh, they depend on. Thank you. Let's check with Simon. Is there any question online? Yes, there is a question about the sensors. Um, water, Professor Berthard, can you say more about the type of sensors used to collect data? And do you use Internet of Things analytics on those data? No. Um, yes, indeed. So we focused mostly on uh, water level uh, data. Uh, in combination with those, those V-notch wares that I showed uh, earlier on, uh, simply because river flow is, is one of the, the most fundamental type of, of, um, of measurements and, and one where new technologies, particularly non-contact uh, methods, have a lot of, lot of scope. So that, that's a, a specific technology that we focused on because it's, it's what, um, uh, what serves us as best. In terms of IoT, uh, Internet of Things technologies, 
we do use uh, some. We're starting to experiment with um, uh, with, with um, uh, data transmission using local networks like uh, LoRa uh, and and others. So we're we're eager adopters, uh, but uh, we, we remain water resources engineers, not, not electronic engineers, so very, very keen to stand on the shoulders of others, in this case, the um, electron, electronic engineers that develop those technologies, and then really what we try and do is, is um, leverage them for the specific purpose of alleviating the issue of data scarcity in, in mountains. So we are very eager users of the, the technology and crash test uh, the, the technologies, if you will, in, in probably some of the most challenging uh, environments that you can, you can imagine. Thank you. Back to the yes, you sir. The mic coming to you. If you'd like to say um, your name and affiliation, please. Alejandro Dusayant um, from Universidad Eisen in Chile and um, Middlesex University. About a wonderful presentation. Um, Maybe my only criticism is that there's no Chilean Andes. <laughs> Maybe next one. Uh, as a ecology professor of mine and then colleague used to say, nature doesn't give without taking. There's a trade-off always. Um, I, if you could comment on the natural flow regime and how, if, if at all, we need to be careful, cautious, whether with our nature-based solutions um, we might overshoot and maybe change the water resource in space or time in a way that might affect, for example, uh, fluvial system um, species that depend on certain timing of water or quantity of water at certain uh, time in, in the year. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's, that's not unique, obviously, to, to nature-based solutions. Any intervention within the, in, in the, the catchment hydrology will have an impact on, for instance, the, the downstream flow regime. The, the, probably the biggest example is building a dam will clearly uh, influence downstream uh, yeah, bays and, and peak flows and, and the distribution. So, so any human activity that alters the, 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 the catchment will have implications for things like ecological uh, diversity and, and the, um, uh, the ecohydrological system. So I would put it broader, and I think there the key element is indeed ideally try and, and look at, at, at all the, uh, the, the processes that are affected. And obviously very often a, a catchment is managed for a certain purpose, for instance water supply of a, of a downstream city, but, but any, any intervention will have that creates certain benefits is likely to create side effects, some of which might be, uh, might be disadvantages. I think that's the, the key reason to look at, at the catchment as a, as a broader system with all the, the services that it provides to, to humanity, but also, for instance, in terms of, of, of eco ecology and, and ecological status. And getting to grips with those, those trade-offs uh, and, and the, the whole, the, 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 the total package of benefits and disbenefits, I think, is, is, is key and it's very much where the, the, the discipline as, as a whole is, is trying to, to get to a more holistic understanding, if you will, rather than just looking at a, at a specific process and, and tinkering with that and potentially creating knock-on effects beyond uh, your, uh, your field of view, if you will. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. So we go online and then we go to uh, Professor Butler after that. So, uh, Simon. Um, this. Uh, David, I think I would guess Hannah <laughs> says, nice talk, Walter, congratulations. How do you ensure participants or citizens have the most useful, useful science to make beneficial choices for their sustainable use of water resources and ecosystem services? Ah, good question from a, a long-term collaborator. Uh, he obviously knows where the, the biggest challenges lie in the, in the science. Um, yeah, that, that really is, is one of the, one of the, the, key, uh, the key challenges. Um, so participation is all great, but coming to really a, an equitable relation between all the, uh, between all, all the, the stakeholders is, is fundamental and, and is, is, a, is a, big, a big challenge. And in a way, I step a bit outside my, my area of expertise, but it's the reason why we, we, we try and include, for instance, social scientists who look at aspects like um, 
uh, indeed access, uh, but also, for instance, power relations, because in the end, as a, as a scientist, you're, you're, you're one of the actors, and at the same time, you try and, 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 and take some distance from that, that whole process, and that's a bit of a walking and, and um, a thin line uh, between different, um, uh, those, those, um, uh, those, those different hats you've got, or the different role, roles that you play. And, and uh, yeah, that's where we, uh, we, we um, work together with social scientists that, that observe that, that process and, and try and, and, and um, understand uh, to which extent uh, that, uh, that the new knowledge is being created, uh, for instance, um, uh, is used and, and, and um, uh, benefits uh, local, local communities. But that's, that's really a, a very hard uh, challenge to get that right. Thank you. Adrian. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your talk. It's uh, uh, very uh, um, enlightening and uh, great to see all that you've been achieving over these last uh, uh, few years. Um, you talked about interventions. And of course, the biggest intervention we're doing as a society is changing the physical and chemical properties of our atmosphere and hence the energy balance and the hydrological response of the planet. Um, You've been studying these high altitude catchments where, of course, glaciers are retreating and snow melt, uh, that, that key runoff from snow melt uh, is also changing. I'm just wondering how concerned are you for these catchments as you start to lose those cryogenic processes uh, in terms of the impacts that it will have on those communities that you've been helping? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question and indeed one that, that gets a lot of attention. I would almost want to, to push back a bit in the sense that, that obviously, undoubtedly, climate change will have a, a main impact, but it's one amongst many other pressures on those, those systems as well. Uh, and, and while, um, for instance, cryosphere melt will have a, a, a local impact, um, the further you go, in, in a way, that, that signal dilutes and at some point will, will become insignificant and actually other types of, um, of impacts will, will dominate. And obviously, which, which of those is, 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 is most important in a certain location really depends on the way that, um, that, that, that the cryosphere signal uh, mixes with, for instance, groundwater, uh, surface water from, from non-cryospheric sources, as well as the type of change you, will, you, you expect in the, in the future. And I think that's really the, the, the critical aspect to try and, and get right, and the very reason that at, a, at, at a, the beginning I had this, um, uh, let me go here, um, here is this um, uh, graph that shows, the, for instance, the downstream distance of the relative contribution of, uh, of different systems. You can see that Meltwater is obviously very important at, um, at the top of the, the catchment, but then will, its relative significance will, will decrease while it mixes with, uh, with other sources of, of water. And obviously that also is important to then understand in the way that, that climate change might, um, might, might, for instance, reduce or change this signal, but probably will also change other signals. Wetlands themselves are also very, um, 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 very, very susceptible to, for instance, drying and irreversible degradation as a result of, um, of climate change. And so understanding those different impacts from climate change, but also other uh, pressures like environmental degradation, water quality change, uh, land use change, uh, is, is important to really know what is, what is the priority and what is the overall uh, change that you can expect from a pressure like, um, uh, like climate change. And I think that, that really is, is the, one of the key challenges to understand in, in these kind of environments. Thank you. I think one last question, please. Your name and affiliation, please. Thank you. Great talk, Walter, like, like always. Uh, Stefan Krause, University of Birmingham. I, I'm wondering, the examples that you have given, we're very much optimizing water quantity and in the definition of you and water that you have up here for water security, it's saying acceptable quantity and quality of water. Do you see a risk with some of the examples like the, the leaky uh, dams and leaky uh, uh, canals that you have given, which are a little bit forcing a managed aquifer recharge that we trade off water quantity for water quality? And is there something in there for your type of sensors and sensor networks to actually make sure that we are not losing the quality of water uh, that, that really is essential, in particular when we think of groundwater and, and, and subsurface water resources as well? 
Yeah, I can't agree more. Um, it definitely is, yeah, you definitely need to, to take into account both. And in, in certain um, conditions, you might have a, have a trade-off, although I would expect in the case of a lot of the, uh, the, the nature-based solutions in particular, that, that you'd often be able to, to capture both and create a, an improvement both in, in water quality and, and quantity. But yes, I focused on the, the quantity aspect because that's what we do in our group, but it definitely doesn't mean that, that uh, quality isn't important. And I think it again shows the need for interdisciplinary approaches and, and bring the, the required expertise together to, um, uh, to combine both. And, and, and water quality is definitely a, a very important factor on the, uh, on the minds of, of, of water resources managers and one where, where arguably many of the, the processes and, and issues uh, that I've, uh, I've touched upon, for instance, the lack of data is, is arguably even worse or, or, or um, in, in the case of, um, of water quality compared to water quantity. So yeah, it's definitely, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the water security includes both for good reason and um, we, should, we should look at both in order to solve these problems. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure the conversation will continue, but we worked you ever so hard uh, and so, uh, Please take a rest. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so the reason I didn't ask for a, a big round of applause is that um, I've now got the pleasure of inviting, actually, uh, Professor Baita had mentioned her name in the presentation, if you're being keen and you are following. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to... Um, introduce to you and welcome uh, our director of the Cen Center for Systems Engineering and Innovation, uh, Dr. Anna Mejish, to uh, pass a vote of thanks to Professor Baitaid. So, Anna, welcome. Thank you, Washington. Um, good evening, or as Walter said, good morning or good afternoon uh, for the people who are online. Um, and thanks, Walter, for giving me the opportunity to close this, I think, really beautiful evening. And, um, when I was thinking about what I should say today as, as someone who knows Wouter quite well, <laughs> I, I thought maybe the easiest way to do that is to think of three words that describe Wouter as, as a person, uh, as a scientist, and as a leader. So I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, and the first one that I've chosen, Wouter, is generous. Uh, and I do say that as someone who knows Wouter for a very long time since he came to Imperial uh, as a postdoc. And uh, Wouter first became my friend, <laughs> and then my boss, <laughs> which didn't last for too long. Um, and then, then we became colleagues. So in, in some ways, it's a huge privilege to be here because I do feel that we kind of grew up together academically. So from that journey, I've seen Wouter uh, as a person who is really selflessly sharing his time and knowledge and ideas. Um, and that is manifested in many examples of Wouter uh, giving the feedback to the proposals, uh, sharing his PhD students, uh, giving the opportunity for his younger colleagues to work very closely with him and even lead the proposals, uh, which is very, very strange in an academic community for those who have been around for, for a while. Wouter also keeps the people together and brings the people together. Uh, and lots of us here in the room and online are know each other because of Wouter, which is really important for bringing and, and having scientific communities and networks. So my first thanks, Wouter, is a very personal one from me and from, from all the people that you have been working with. And thank you for being very generous with, uh, uh, we talk about the scarcity, very scarce um, resources in the academic, which is the time and ideas and, and knowledge. And then uh, my second word for Wouter uh, is inspirational and something that Wouter maybe didn't mention uh, tonight, but he's very often talking about the hydrolo hydrology as an inclusive science. Um, and what he means by that is that really the purpose of the science is not to do the science because of the science, but to do the science to create a real impact on the ground. And I think if anything, what we've seen tonight is that impact that he managed to already create um, and uh, the presentation that can include so many photos of the things happening on the, on the ground. Um, Wouter uh, has forever changed our knowledge and understanding of the hydrology and human impacts in the Andes 
We've seen that tonight, and not just in the Andes, but in all other countries in the world, including we've seen examples from India, from Nepal, and from Africa. And Wouter is also something that is very rare in engineering, is interdisciplinary research, and we've seen examples tonight around using the citizen science in the context of sustainable development. We have seen his great efforts in having the networks uh, of the low-cost low sensors to try to get more information around the hydrological modeling or and monitoring. And then finally, I think coming to the impact, we've also seen a great effort uh, of creating a network of the participatory monitoring, which is operational now for many years. And uh, Washington mentioned at the beginning that Walter this year received Henry Darcy Medal. I just want to say that this is the most prestigious medal that the hydrologist can get. So Walter, uh, my second thanks is from the whole hydrological community that you have been inspiring for many years now. And uh, on a personal level, I'm really looking forward to celebrating the medal in Vienna in a couple of months' time. And then um, the final word for Walter um, is uh, the way I think about the Walter as a leader. And I've chosen the word influential. Uh, and those who know Walter really well, they will know that he is not the person who talks um, easily about his successes. But um, we all know that influence very often comes from leading by example. And um, those of you who will have the opportunity or had the opportunity to meet Walter in his office, you would see lots of equipment that is lying around uh, that is used for his low cost sensors that he is still putting together on his own. But uh, his very, very good technical skills do come with the ability to think strategically, to bring people together and create new avenues of research. And I'm very much looking forward, Walter, to seeing uh, where the research around the nature-based solutions in the water security will, will take us. Um, in the room, we have our environmental and water resources engineering section. And I think as a member of the section, Walter, I'm really looking forward for you shape, to shape future hydrology research and also education. And I think from the departmental and the college level, we have in Walter someone who can shape and influence the research strategies and particularly in the context of sustainable development and interdisciplinary research. So um, finally, I would just like all of you uh, who are here and maybe even online to join me in the final round of applause, uh, Walter, for this beautiful evening, for the very inspiring lecture and everything you have done for the hydrological community. Thank you. Thank you.